I'm going to share with you my screen. Uh, this is a blood vessel, guys. Um, if you remember, actually, I'm going to uh, talk with you about blood vessels. Main blood vessels, we have arteries and veins. And if you remember the structure, we were talking about three layers. We were talking about the tunica intima, which is made of endothelium or simply squamous epithelium. If you remember the second layer, it's made of muscle. And this one, it's uh, uh, smooth muscle. And as you can see here, you have some elastic uh, tissue. And that elastic tissue is proper for big arteries. We're going to uh, later share an information about that with you. And the third layer, the outer layer, it's always a tunica externa. And this one is made of fibrous connective tissue. Then again, we have three layers for our arteries and veins. We have the endothelium. Then we have the middle layer, which is the tunica media made of smooth muscle and elastic uh, fibers and the tunica externa, which is made of uh, connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue. As you can see here, the difference with a vein is we have the same endothelium, uh, the same squamous, simple squamous epithelium here, but the muscular layer is thinner because these blood vessels, they are good for volume, not for pressure. Arteries are good for pressure. Veins are good for volume. And actually, the thicker um, layer in these uh, blood vessels are the tunica externa. Then you can see here in this slide, you have always an artery and you have the muscular layer is wider than in a vein. And a vein has a longer, bigger, larger diameter. You can see here, we can have more blood inside of a vein than in an artery. Then arteries are good for pressure, veins are good for volume. Then we have another kind of uh, blood vessels. Between arteries and capillaries, we have these ones. And these uh, small arteries are called arterioles. Arterioles are uh, small arteries, very small arteries, and they have muscle. Actually, they are called muscular arterioles. Then, lastly, we have capillaries. And capillaries, they are really tiny ones, really th uh, thin ones, and they are able to interchange blood with tissues and with the venial uh, part. Then this part of the capillaries, they have oxygenated blood, and at the end, we're going to have deoxygenated blood. But guys, I'm going to stop sharing with you my screen because I would like to show you uh, a classification we already discussed in class, but I'm going to show you this classification because it's really important. Uh, I hope you can read here, guys. Then again, we have arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. And as you can remember, arteries, they have the internal layer. This is called tunica intima or tunica interna. It's made of epithelial tissue or endothelium. Then we have the tunica media, which is made of muscle, and the tunica externa, which is made of uh, connective tissue. And we have three kinds of arteries. We have large arteries, medium arteries, and small arteries. The large arteries are called conduction arteries. And why conduction? Because they are in charge of carrying blood from the heart to the organ. Then we and they they are able to and finally, we have small arteries. 
and they are called resistance because we're going to explain later they play an important role for the blood pressure guys these two large and medium they have elastic fibers in these tunica media then they are able to stretch small arteries they don't have elastic fibers then they only have muscle here then small arteries and arterioles both of them are called muscular and large arteries and medium arteries they are called elastic because they have elastic fibers now with capillaries if you remember capillaries only have one layer the internal layer made of epithelial tissues or endothelium which is the tunica intima capillaries has no tunica media Capillary, ha they have no uh, tunica externa. Then they don't have tunica media, they don't have tunica externa. They only have tunica intima. And they can be three kinds they can be continuous, fenestrated, or discontinuous. And this difference is because uh, capillaries, they should be thin, really thin, and, but they are leaky because they allow us to cross blood, um, uh, blood cells, proteins, some substances, but the continuous ones are leaky and they are very uh, common in our lungs. The fenestrated ones are more leaky, are leakier than the continuous ones. And they are very common in our kidneys because we need to filter our blood. And the discontinuous ones are the leakiest one. They have the uh, larger pores and holes on their walls, and they are very common in our liver. Why? Because we need to filter our blood in our uh, uh, liver, and we need to synthesize big molecules. Then we need bigger holes in that filter. Then again, we have three kinds of capillaries. We have continuous capillaries, they are common in our lungs. We have fenestrated capillaries, and they are common in our kidneys for ear infiltration. And finally, we have discontinuous capillaries, which are the leakiest ones, because we need to filter. We need to uh, allow the, the crossing of bigger molecules, such as proteins. Then, guys, I need you remember these things, because this classification is really, really important. I'm going to stop sharing with you my screen for a second. I'm going to share with you my uh, PowerPoint again. Give me a second. Then, guys, we're talking about blood vessels. Then, you know, we have arteries, arterioles, capillaries. And in this part, you can check we have deoxygenated blood and we're able to interchange that blood with the tissue and then finally with the capillaries again and we have deoxygenated blood that swell in our capillaries this is a uh, continuous capillaries again these are common in our lungs you can see here, they have only one layer. It's only one cell. And you have these cells with blood inside. Then you have fenestrated capillaries. These are for filtration. These are common in our kidneys. Then you can see here the red blood cell, and you can see only one layer of cells but you can see here some pores some fenestration some holes and they're going to be important in our uh, kidneys and finally you have these kind of capillaries these are called discontinuous because they have they have really big holes really big fenestrations and they're common for example in our liver guys later we're going to see uh, a video about capillary change. 
and how we can uh, produce an edema. Remember, when we have two cells together, actually, let me draw that. When we have two cells together, when we have a cell and another cell, this space in between the cells is called interstitial space. And when we have a blood vessel, we're able to get blood or fluid inside of this space. The accumulation of this liquid in this space, in the interstitial space, is called edema. Then we're going to watch a video about how to prevent edema and how we can manage the capillary exchange. Give me a second. I'm going to stop sharing with you. I'm going to look for the video. And here we have the capillary exchange. I'm going to share with you my screen again. Let me know, guys, if you're able to hear the video, the, if you're able to hear the sound of the video. Capillaries are thin-walled blood vessels with an arterial and venous end. Their thin walls and narrow diameter are optimal Thank for you. the exchange of fluid, gases, nutrients, and waste between blood and tissues of the body. This process is called capillary exchange. In general, fluid moves out of capillaries at their arterial ends. Most, but not all, of that fluid re-enters at their venous ends. The forces that drive fluid and its dissolved contents into and out of capillaries are net hydrostatic pressure, which is the difference between blood and interstitial fluid pressures, and oncotic pressure, which is the difference between blood and interstitial colloid osmotic pressures. Net filtration pressure is the difference between net hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. This regulates the inward and outward movement of fluid at each end of the capillary. At the arterial end of the capillary, a positive net filtration pressure favors movement of fluid from the blood into the interstitial space. For example, the difference between a net hydrostatic pressure of 33 millimeters mercury and an oncotic pressure of 20 millimeters mercury results in a net filtration pressure of 13 millimeters mercury that forces fluid out of the capillary. The shift from filtration to reabsorption at the venous end of the capillary is due to a lower capillary blood or hydrostatic pressure. Here, the difference between a net hydrostatic pressure of 13 millimeters mercury and an oncotic pressure of 20 millimeters mercury results in a net filtration pressure of negative 7 millimeters mercury. This negative net filtration pressure forces fluid from the interstitial space back into the capillary. Approximately 90% of the fluid that leaves the blood capillary at its arterial end will re-enter at its venous end. Lymphatic capillaries capture the remaining 10% of the fluid. Fluid in the lymphatic system is eventually returned to the bloodstream. This table summarizes the forces that influence the fluid exchange at the arterial and venous ends of a capillary. Capillaries, capillaries. Then guys, when we have accumulation of fluid because we have a problem or a failure in, for example, uh, our um, uh, capillaries, or maybe we have a failure in our lymphatic vessels, we're going to accumulate that fluid between cells. And that space between cells is called interstitial space. When you have fluid in that space, it's called edema. Again, when you have an excess of fluid in that space, it's called edema. I'm going to stop sharing for a second here with you. And I'm going to, set, I want to share again my PowerPoint. Guys, normally when you have a valve, it's because you need to avoid backflow. Then when you have a valve, for example, venous valves, we're avoiding backflow. Then we can close every single valve in order to avoid uh, backflow from superior to inferior veins. This is going to be the function of any valves like we had in our heart with AV valves and semi-lunar valves 
the same function is in our veins. Remember, we don't have a pump, we don't have a heart pumping blood uh, to our uh, veins. This time it's gonna be muscular tissue, the skeletal muscles. When we walk, when we move our body, we're able to pump that blood back to the heart and we use these valves inside the veins in order to uh, get that blood back to the heart. Guys, when we have problems with these valves, then we're gonna have varicose veins. We're gonna have varices. In our, uh, it could be in our legs, it could be in any part in our body, uh, but it's more often in our legs. Guys, again, arteries are good for force, for power, for pressure. That is the reason we have only 10 to 12% of our blood in our arteries. Mostly, we have our blood in our veins. Then veins are good for volume. We have two thirds of our blood in our systemic veins. Uh, mostly in our small veins and venules. And we have only 10 to 12% in of our by of our blood in arteries. 10 to 12% is in our lungs, 8 to 11% is in our hearts, and we have only 4 to 5% in our capillaries. As usual, guys, these uh, charts are very really important. You can differentiate here arteries from arterioles, from capillaries, from venules and veins. And you can have here the structure of the wall and the function of each of them. Remember, arteries, we have three kinds. We have conduction arteries, we have distribution arteries, and we have resistance arteries. And for veins, we have great veins and small veins. For capillaries, we have uh, continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and discontinuous capillaries. Remember, continuous, often in our lungs, fenestrated, often in our kidneys, discontinuous, often in our liver. As you already know, guys, I told you about the blood pressure. You were able to measure your blood pressure we use the brachial artery to measure our blood pressure, and we have these instruments, which is the sphygmomanometer. And again, a sphygmomanometer is the instrument to measure the blood pressure. And if you can remember, we have two blood pressures. We have the higher one, which is the systolic one, and we have the lower one, which is the diastolic one. And you can see here, we have the manometer. And here, you are able to hear um, when we're deflating the cuff, this is the cuff. When you're deflating the cuff, you're able to hear your systolic uh, pressure with the first sound. And the last sound is gonna be the diastolic pressure. Here you can see, guys, the different points to access to your pulse. And then the most important ones, the carotid one, brachial for your blood pressure, radial, and femoral. Um, some of other peripheral pulses, such as popliteal artery, dorsalis pedis artery, or posterior tibial arteries, these are really important when you have a catheterism because usually you use these veins to access to your heart then you use normally the brachial artery for your blood pressure, the radial artery for accessing your normal or regular pulse, your carotid artery, but the lower limb pulses, such as the femoral one, the popliteal one, the posterior tibial artery and dorsalis pedis artery, you use these four when you have a procedure and you're using uh, the inferior limbs, uh, for example, uh, the catheterism for the heart, and then you can check if you have a blockage, if you have a difference regarding your heart versus regarding your uh, inferior limbs, your low.
lower. This is the guys, artery. Remember, these layer, only one layer is the epithelial uh, endothelium. And this space is for the blood vessel, for the blood cell. Then your uh, red blood cell is going to be here. And this is the space called lumen. When you have a problem inside of the blood vessel, such as a plaque, this is a piece of fat, this is a piece of lipid, then you're going to have obstruction of your arteries. Then if you have obstruction of your arteries, you're going to reduce the flow to your organs. Here you can see a severe uh, problem. You can see here the plaque, which is really, really, really thick, and it, you only have a reduced lumen for the blood. Then guys, you have the blood pressure. The blood pressure is the pressure that the blood exerts on the wall. Then you have the pipe. If you remember the blood vessel, you have the pipe. And what you have here is blood. And here, that blood is pressing the wall, against to the wall. Then we can have low blood pressure or high blood pressure. These factors increase the blood pressure. If, for example, if you have an overload of fluid in your um, blood vessels, you're going to have high blood pressure. If your heart rate increases, you're going to have higher blood pressure. If you have the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood pumped by every single ventricle every single time, then you're going to have higher blood pressure. For example, if you have um, dehydration because your blood viscosity is increasing, for example, if you have a higher concentration of uh, red blood vessels, I told you last time it's called polycytemia, that polycytemia is increasing the viscosity of the blood, then you're going to have high blood pressure. And finally, if you have resistance, if you have blockage, for example, a piece of fat, atherosclerosis, then you're going to have another factor for high blood pressure. Guys, our body is very intelligent. We're able to regulate the blood pressure. Normally, you have blood pressure around 120 to 80. Then... 120 systolic, 80 uh, diastolic. When you have your pressure very high, you need to decrease that blood pressure. Then you have some receptors in your um, blood vessels. These receptors are called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors. They are for pressure. Baroreceptors. Vital receptors are for pressure. Then we have some in our uh, aorta. We have some in our carotid arteries. And they send a message to your medulla oblongata. Remember, our, our brain is able to control our blood pressure. Then when you have that message, it's going to be sending a message to the inhibitory cardio center. And then you send another message. This time it's going to be through the glossopharyngeal or pneumogastric cranial nerves in order to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember AP1, guys, the autonomic nervous system has two parts, sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. When you have the sympathetic nervous system, you need to increase the heart rate and blood pressure. But this time, you need to decrease because it's very high. Then you're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Then you're using some neurotransmitters, some uh, acetylcholine instead. On the contrary, imagine that you have low blood pressure. Then if you have low blood pressure, for example, a patient uh, with a bleeding, it could be an internal bleeding because of uh, an ulcer. It could be an external bleeding because of a wound. 
it could be a patient with uh, dehydration, then you have low blood pressure. Then this patient is going to send another message through the same bioreceptors. It's going to tell, hey guys, we need to increase our blood pressure. And it's sending again a message again to the medulla oblongata. But this time we're going to activate the sympathetic uh, nervous system and we're going to produce norepinephrine and adrenaline. Then when we have high pressure, we activate the parasympathetic nervous system. When we have low blood pressure, we activate the sympathetic nervous system. When we have activated the parasympathetic nervous system, we use acetylcholine. When we activate the sympathetic nervous system, we use norepinephrine. And this is the control of our uh, blood pressure. Guys, I'm going to show you a video about bioreceptors and chemoreceptors because we are able to decrease or increase our heart rate because of the uh, pressure and we are able to modify our function in our heart because of the pH of the blood, because of the oxygen of the blood, and because of the carbon dioxide in our blood. Then we have a video about bioreceptors and another video about chemo, chemo receptors. Let me stop sharing with you my screen, guys. Give me a second. And then we're going to look for these videos. Let me check with you. First, going to be the bioreceptors video. Increased blood pressure. And I'm going to share with you this screen. Give me a second, guys. I'm going to share with you this screen, which is the video about bar receptors. It stretches the carotid arteries and aorta, causing the baroreceptors to increase their basal rate of action potential generation. Action potentials are conducted by the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves to the cardioregulatory and vasomotor centers in the medulla oblongata. As a result of increased stimulation from the baroreceptors, the cardioregulatory center increases parasympathetic stimulation to the heart, which decreases the heart rate. Also, as a result of the increased stimulation from the baroreceptors, the cardiovascular center decreases sympathetic stimulation to the heart, which decreases heart rate and stroke volume. The vasomotor center decreases sympathetic stimulation to blood vessels, causing vasodilation. The vasodilation, along with the decreased heart rate and decreased stroke volume, bring the elevated blood pressure back toward normal. If the initial problem were a decrease in blood pressure, the activities and effects of the baroreceptors, cardiovascular center, and vasomotor center would be the opposite of what is illustrated. Okay, guys, when you have high blood pressure, you're sending some messages from the carotid, uh, from the aortic uh, receptors, and you have two more in your carotid arteries, and you're sending this message through the parasympathetic nervous system to your medulla oblongata. Then you're able to reach your heart again. If you have high blood pressure, you're able to decrease the heart rate and blood pressure. If you have, on the contrary, low blood pressure, you are able to increase the heart rate and blood pressure here. This is the bioreceptor control of our function in our heart. Now I'm going to show you the function of the chemoreceptors because chemoreceptors are um, controllers for, for our... Uh, let me check for a second, guys, because I cannot find the video. Give me a second, guys. I'm going to stop recording. And now we're going to have the video for chemoreceptors. 
Hemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies monitor blood oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH. Impulses from these chemoreceptors are conducted to the control centers for heart and blood vessels via the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. Chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata monitor blood carbon dioxide and pH. Decreased blood oxygen, increased carbon dioxide or decreased pH, decreased parasympathetic stimulation of the heart, which increases the heart rate. Decreased blood oxygen, increased carbon dioxide, and decreased pH increase sympathetic stimulation of the heart, which increases heart rate and stroke volume. Increased sympathetic stimulation of blood vessels increases vasoconstriction. Okay, guys, this could be a little bit overwhelming. I'm going to try to explain this uh, in my whiteboard. Give me a second going to be easier this way. If you remember, guys, we have our nervous system and you have motor and sensor. And if you remember, we have a voluntary part and involuntary part. The involuntary part is going to be the autonomic nervous system. And it's divided in sympathetic and parasympathetic. But the sympathetic one is for norepinephrine, nor adrenaline, adrenaline, and epinephrine. And the parasympathetic one is for acetyl choline. Then every single time you have low pH, low concentration of oxygen, and high concentration of carbon dioxide, then this is gonna result in a stimulation of your sympathetic nervous system. Then you're gonna produce more noradrenaline, norepinephrine, and you're gonna increase the heart rate and the blood pressure. And every single time we need oxygen, this is hypoxia, hypoxia. If we need oxygen, we can increase our heart rate and blood pressure. On the contrary, if we have higher pH, higher oxygen, and lower carbon dioxide, then we're going to stimulate this time the parasympathetic. And then we're going to produce acetylcholine. And instead of increasing, we're going to decrease our heart rate and blood pressure. Then, when we have enough oxygen, we're going to decrease our heart rate and blood pressure. Guys, I know this is this could be a little bit overwhelming, but um, this is the function for chemoreceptors. I'm going to share with you again my screen with you. Then, guys, we have the cardiac output normally it's going to increase with uh, the heart rate and the blood pressure. Remember, the cardiac output is the amount of blood which is pumped by the ventricles uh, in a whole minute. Then when we have, for any reason, it could be because we have smaller arteries, it could be because we have harder arteries, it could be because we have a blockage of an artery, then we have increasing our blood pressure. Then when we have increasing our blood pressures, we're going to send a message to our baroreceptors. Remember, we have in the aorta and our carotids, baroreceptors. Baro means pressure. Then we're sending those messages to our brain, where specifically in our medulla oblongata. And we're able to send that messages back to the heart through the parasympathetic in order to decrease the heart rate. Then we're inhibiting our sino-auricular node. And then we're able to decrease the heart rate and decrease pressure.
when we have then lower blood pressure, then we have uh, pressure uh, returning towards normal. On the contrary, if we have a patient with bleeding because maybe uh, he or she has a low blood pressure, maybe it's bleeding, maybe it's dehydrated, maybe it's losing, uh, he has or she has an internal bleeding, whatever it has, um, it's going to be a low flow of blood to the kidneys. And then we're able to activate this mechanism, which is a, um, a hormonal mechanism. And we're going to describe this hormonal mechanism better when we see the urinary system. Then you already know we're able to control our blood pressure and heart rate because of the pressure because of the chemicals in your blood, such as uh, carbon dioxide or oxygen or pH, and we're able to control our blood pressures because of the hormones in our uh, body, in our um, kidneys. Then we're gonna produce these substances, renin, angiotensin II, in order to increase the blood pressure when we have low blood pressure for example, in a patient which is shocked or bleeding or dehydrated. Guys, these are drugs used in patients with uh, heart problems. We have, in order to reduce the blood pressure to treat the hypertension, we use these kind of drugs. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, uh, angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors. This is not material for you in this, at this time, but you need to know we have some drugs in order to decrease the hypertension, which is a common problem in the United States. Guys, this image is to remember you guys. We use the skeletal muscles in order to pump blood back to the heart. We don't have a heart uh, pumping blood in the veins. Instead of that, we use our skeletal muscles. It could be walking, it could be moving our body in order to pump that blood back to the heart. And remember, the function of these valves is closing that valve in order to avoid the backflow. We, knew we have to avoid the backflow always. This is the capillary to interchange, uh, and but we're going to discuss this concept about the internal respiration. If you remember classes of AP1, I told you guys we have external respiration, internal respiration, and cellular respiration, and we're going to come in this concept uh, during the respiratory system session. Guys, now we're going to have, I'm going to stop sharing with you my materials for a second. Guys, do you have any questions so far? Do you have any questions so far? Let me know in the chat. Let me know in the chat if you have any questions so far. Okay, no questions. Guys.